ذلك الدين القيم ولكن أكثر الناس لا يعلمون وقل الحمد لله الذي لم يتخذ ولدا ولم يكن له شريك في الملك ولم يكن له ولي من الذل وكبره تكبيرا وأشهد أن محمدا عبد الله ورسوله وصفيه وخليله أرسله الله للناس نذيرا وبشيرا قل إن كنتم تحبون الله فاتبعوني يحببكم الله ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم لقد كان لكم في رسول الله أسوة حسنة لمن كان يرجو الله واليوم الآخر وذكر الله كثيرا من يطع الله ورسوله وأول الأمر من المؤمنين فقد رشد ومن يعص الله ورسوله وأول الأمر من المؤمنين فقد ضل ضلالا بعيدا أوصيكم ونفسي أولا بتقوى الله وطاعته وأحذركم من عثيانه ومخالفة أمره أما بعد فإن خير الحديث كتاب الله وأحسن الهدي حج محمد وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار يقول الله عز وجل وهو أصدق القائلين في كتابه الكريم يا أيها الذين آمنوا لا تأكل الربا أضعافا مضاعفة واتقوا الله لعلكم تفلحون واتقوا النار التي أعدت للكافرين وأطيعوا الله والرسول لعلكم ترحمون وسارعوا إلى مغفرة من ربكم وجنة عرضها السماوات والأرض أعدت للمتقين الذين ينفقون في الصراء والضراء والكاظمين الغيظ والعافين عن الناس والله يحب المحسنين Brothers and sisters committed Muslims I'd like to talk to you today 
as a brother to a brother and as a brother to a sister about the kind of world that we live in and how to help those who are trying to make it better. And in particular, I'd like to talk to you and I don't want to lecture you. But nonetheless, I'd like to talk to you in particular about this thing that is called petrodollar recycling. This is not a term that you would hear often used or often described in a Jum'ah khutbah or in a presentation from the member. So the same petrodollars that I intend to talk about are the ones that are recycled to buy the quietism of the khatibs on the member. and to buy their capitulation. But in order to talk about this concept, this idea, this process, we would have to put it within the context and within the frame of reference of Allah's word and the perfect example of the implementation of those words in the person of his final messenger alayhi wa alihi salatu wa salam and so these ayat which were just quoted from Surah Ali Imran And for those of you who are interested, these are ayat 130 to 134. These ayat begin with, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, la ta'kulu riba adhaafa mudaafa. Wattaqu allaha la'allakum tuflihoon. O you who are securely committed to Allah, Do not gorge yourselves by doubling and redoubling corrupt financial transactions or illegal financial transactions. But at the same time, be conscious of Allah's corrective power if you intend to be successful. The context of the revelation of these ayat is the battle of Uhud. The guidance and the description about the battle of Uhud that has been revealed in Surah Ali Imran that context is related also to the revelation about riba. It is not a coincidence that the battle of Uhud is framed in an emphasis on riba. And when we talk about riba, we are not talking about an erroneous translation in the form of interest. 
we are trying to move beyond these, res- this, these restrictive and reductionist translations which dumb down and limit the meaning of Allah's word. And so when we talk about riba, we are talking about a financial system that, tr- that thrives on creating and widening a gap between the rich and the poor. We are talking about a financial system that, tri- that thrives on creating pain between those who borrow money and those who lend money. We are talking about a financial system that thrives upon allowing a certain financial class to build up revenues and capitals by any means necessary at the expense of the labor of those who are not compensated. In practical terms, we are talking about a financial system that has wed capitalism to racism. We are talking about a financial system which is at the root of the foundation of the United States and of the Zionist entity that occupies Palestine. The coming together and the wedding of capitalism to racism. Or in other words, we are talking about a financial system that only gives the illusion of civil rights. For there are no civil rights until the financial system that created the conditions to demand civil rights is eradicated. And so there is no capitalism without racism and racism is severely curtailed if capitalism is destroyed. And so those who are in decision-making positions with the force of these ayahs they have to decide whether they are whether or not they are going to include riba in their economic system and thereby in their body politic and in their military affairs. But before we go further, let us take a deeper look at the way Allah Ta'ala deals with riba, at the complementary difference between the way he deals with it in Surah Al-Baqarah and Surah Ali Imran. In Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah Ta'ala presents the concept of riba along with the concept of sadaqa. Riba, which is coercive spending, and sadaqa, which is cooperative spending. Describe two diametrically opposed concepts that are at the root of two dissimilar economic systems. And so when we talk of riba, what we mean is a capital class that engorges itself with wealth at the expense of the majority of people who are below the poverty line. Now obviously Allah Ta'ala's book does not mention anything about capitalism. At the time that these ayat were revealed, there was not this sophisticated financial system which managed 
the transfer of wealth from the poor to the rich. There is nothing this organized and this sophisticated. But the general idea of taking wealth from those who produce it and giving it to those who produce nothing, that idea was existed at that time. And that idea will continue to exist until the end of time. And it is that idea that Allah Ta'ala is dealing with. And in the world today, we call that idea capitalism. And so the Qur'an, given that it is a transcendental guidance, from the beginning of time until the end of time, regardless of what human beings call this kind of financial injustice, Allah Ta'ala is calling all of those designations riba. And so today, riba is capitalism. The other financial system is related to sadaqah, which concentrates less on concentration and more on distribution. Which concentrates on reducing the gap between the rich and the poor. And so the riba system is inaugurated into society with the military industrial complex. And the sadaqah system is inaugurated into society with the Islamic movement. And so there is an inevitable clash which will take place for those who want their financial dealings to be just and for those who want to avoid war because there is a definite relationship between perpetual war and the concentration of wealth through these riba type of systems. And so in Surah Ali Imran, Allah Ta'ala presents the idea of riba within the context of war. He is trying to tell us that the institutionalization of riba is related to wars of aggression which open up new frontiers for the concentration of wealth by the financial military duopoly. He is trying to tell us that were it not for wars of aggression that the degree of concentration of wealth would be reduced to its menial status. But it is because of wars of aggression that we have the degree of polarization of wealth that we witness in the world today. Or perhaps said another way, the more that you see in your world wars of aggression, the more that you can expect to witness the concentration of wealth within the hands of a few people. The less circulation of wealth there is in the world, the more wars of aggression there are in the world. There is a direct relationship between the two. And Allah Ta'ala is trying to focus our attention on this relationship by presenting the details of the battle of Uhud encased in an emphasis on riba. When Muslims fight a battle in the cause of Allah, they fight that battle for a reason. These battles do not occur in a vacuum. There are a certain set of economic circumstances which drive the conditions for war. And Allah Ta'ala is trying to get us to focus and an important precondition to war, which is riba. That were it not for riba, were it not for the institutionalization of corrupt financial dealings, with a view to concentrate that wealth and withdraw it from circulation, 
were it not for that posture, there would not be perpetual war on earth. And so Allah Ta'ala is trying to draw our attention to this relationship by presenting the battle of Uhud within the context of river. But there is a gap in the contemporary Muslim public mind that tends to fragment the integrated lessons that come from Allah, that tends to dissociate these ayat, these life-giving ayat, these facts of life ayat, from the reality which they describe. We think that we can rely on the pundits and the experts to describe that reality for us. But in fact, all they are doing is rationalizing and justifying a position and an ambiance of injustice. The facts of life are contained in Allah's words. And there is no better description of that reality than Allah's words. And it is Allah Ta'ala who is telling us that there is a bona fide relationship, a supportive, mutually functioning relationship between the institutionalization of riba and the conditions of instability that lead to perpetual war. The concentration of wealth requires the concentration of human material and physical resources. The desire to concentrate wealth doesn't happen through individuals. The President of the United States can't by himself bring the wealth of the world to the country. The Prime Minister of Israel can't take the financial wealth of the rest of the world and deposit it in the bank of Israel. They can't do this by themselves. There is a wealth production industry that they have created and that surrounds them. A wealth protection industry that consists of lawyers, that consists of accountants, that consists of think tanks and academics who rationalize and justify the position of polarization in the world. And on top of all of that, the biggest component of the wealth protection industry are the various militaries in the capital class in the world. The militaries of the Europeans, the militaries of the Israelis, the militaries of the Americans. These are the chief components, the chief enforcers of the wealth protection industry. And so when Muslims fight a war, they are not only fighting a war against other militaries. They are fighting a war against the Riba financial industrial complex. They are fighting a war against the militaries that protect the interests of the financial institutions in their society. And so there is no such thing as a secure commitment to Allah that can accommodate a capitalistic financial culture, that can accommodate a culture which thrives on creating and widening a gap between the rich and the poor. But nonetheless, we have people in this world who have Muslim names, who get away with depositing billions and perhaps trillions of dollars of wealth in the Riba financial institutions that impoverish the rest of the world's people.
And so these ayat have a contemporary relevance. The details of the dynamics of Uhud and Riba are not just things of the past. They are at work in the real world that we live in right now. We can talk in detail about the situation in Iraq. About the movement of the oil wealth of that country into the coffers of the financial institutions outside that country. The current situation in that country doesn't have anything now or in the past to do with the withdrawal of U.S. troops. It never had anything to do with the withdrawal of U.S. troops today or in the past. Because the purpose of putting U.S. troops there has already been accomplished. Which is to embed the oil industry of that country into the occupation apparatus. That purpose was accomplished five or six years ago. And so the withdrawal of troops, whether it occurred yesterday or whether it will occur in the future, is completely immaterial. But nonetheless, they are presenting that to you as the most important thing. But the most important thing already occurred. And that is why there are a thousand personnel in the U.S. Embassy in, in Iraq. You don't need a thousand people to process visas. But you do need a thousand people to manage the oil industry and the way that contracts are awarded to oil companies across the world. That's why you need a thousand people. So the U.S. Embassy is functioning as a gatekeeper inside of that country to decide who is going to get contracts and who is not. And so the role of the U.S. military has changed. It has gone from a, an aggressive, occupation-oriented role into protecting the contractors who will be getting these contracts to develop the oil and the fossil fuels inside of that country. But let us get to practicality. Let us talk about how a riba system concentrates wealth in the hands of a few. And so let's talk about practicality. Let's talk about something that is mentioned here and that you ought to go home and think about. And so now we come to the central point of this discussion, which is petrodollar recycling. This is a term that was coined by Henry Kissinger. He was the National Security Advisor and then the Secretary of State to Richard Nixon in the early 70s. And this is a concept which was used to spectacular success by his successor as the National Security Advisor in the name of Zbigniew Brzezinski. Now these are not head then, even though they occupied cabinet positions in the 1970s. They are not head then for any reason whatsoever. For both of them today are trustees and advisors to the international crisis group. Now that may ring a bell for some of you, but it ought to have meaning because another trustee of the International Crisis Group is Kofi Annan, 
the ex-secretary general of the United Nations and the UN envoy who was just sent to Syria. So now we have neocons and Zionists who are trustees of the same organization of which an apparently neutral arbiter is also a trustee of. And it is this neutral arbiter which was sent to Syria. And so you tell me that how neutral can he be if he and his neocon friends are trustees of the same group? And so it was this crowd who in the 1970s came up with this term and developed a concept and an execution potential behind it. Petrodollar recycling. Now let's review a little bit of history. In the early 70s, the United States was just coming out of the Vietnam War. And it was beset at that time with hyperinflation. Some of you may be old enough to remember. It was beset with hyperinflation and with mounting deficits. To such an extent that the president at that time, Richard Nixon, thought of implementing price control, especially on gasoline and it was right around that time that a catalytic event occurred much like 9-11 and that catalytic event was the 1973 Yom Kippur War and many of us may remember that the net effect of that war was an oil embargo on the west which caused endless lines at the gas pump and perhaps a doubling or a tripling of the price of gas. And so right around that time, the United States Treasury struck two important deals. The first of those was that it convinced or perhaps pressured and coerced the OPEC countries, the majority of whom were these Arabian countries in the Gulf. And at that time it included the pre-Islamic revolution Iran of the Shah. That the United States coerced these countries to sell their oil only in dollars. That they would sell oil and only accept payment in dollars. So this required other countries who wanted to buy oil to have a reserve of dollars. But as far as the United States itself was concerned, it didn't have to put up anything of value in order to purchase this oil. All it had to do was print dollars. It didn't have to give up gold, it didn't have to give up services, it didn't have to give up shares in corporations. All it had to do was buy some paper and print some dollars. But as far as other countries were concerned, either they had to sell services and goods to the United States at a bargain basement price in order to get dollars, or they had to borrow from U.S. banks in order to get dollars. And this included countries like Germany and Japan and a whole bunch of other industrialized countries that in order to buy oil, because they could not produce oil on their own, they had to have a reserve of dollars. And this is what made the U.S. dollar the reserve currency in the world. 
convincing the OPEC country to sell their oil only in terms of dollars made the dollar the reserve currency. The second relationship that was managed by the U.S. Treasury was to go to the Saudi Arabian Monetary Authority, the Saudi Arabian Monetary Agency, FAMA, and to convince them that the mega profits that they made from the tripling of the oil price during the oil embargo that they would, re they would redeposit that money back into New York and London banks in order to offset deficits in the UK, in France, in Germany, and in the United States. Because the United States was a war economy. It generates profits when they are in inv invasion mode. But it decreases profits when they're in occupation mode. And so at that time, there were hyper-deficits in the United States. And so, they wanted these Saudi Arabian executives to take their windfall profits and invest them back in U.S. banks and financial institutions, which they did. And at the same time, they wanted to use these mega profits to create a slush fund for covert CIA operations. And we know what those covert operations were all about. In the 1980s, those covert operations seated, unseated, and elected government in Nicaragua. They financed a drug war in Laos and Cambodia, which led to the Pol Pot takeover of that country. It financed a drug war in Afghanistan in the 1980s. It financed a resistance, a covert resistance against the Soviet Union in the 1980s in Afghanistan. And a whole host of other assassinations and unseating of elected governments. And so this is how they termed this, the recycling of petrodollars. But the countries that paid the most when the gas prices tripled are the poor countries. They are the countries who paid the dearest price. For it was already difficult for them to buy energy, to buy oil, and to buy natural gas. But when the prices tripled, how are they going to buy natural gas or oil? What was the solution? And so we have the pinheads and the geeks. The greedy types who are on Wall Street. They made a recommendation. They came out and said, hey OPEC, this money that you're depositing in our banks and financial institutions. Let's turn around and lend it to these poor countries so that they can buy oil. So here we have Muslims who are depositing money in U.S. banks and European banks and financial institutions. And those banks are turning around and lending that money to poor Muslims in other countries. to poor Africans in other countries, to poor Asians who are starving. This is what they mean by recycling petrodollars. And so they turn around and they lend this money by artificially raising the price of oil in order to hook entire economies and perhaps billions of people onto a program of paying interest and paying riba that will never go away. A permanent bondage that is worse than slavery.
And so after making these loans, these banks and financial institutions in London, Europe, and New York, they bring in the IMF as an enforcer. They bring in the IMF as a debt collector. So they make the loans through the IMF or through the World Bank and they give the loans to their crony capital partners who happen to be the leaders and their proxies in those countries and then they bring in the IMF as an enforcer to tell these people mind you they're telling the people not their leaders that you have to pay this money back that you have to pay these loans back but as far as the leaders who borrowed the money we'll give you this villa in Monaco or we'll allow you to gamble in Las Vegas or we'll allow you to have this chain of hotels in this part of the world and so they come in as an enforcer telling these poor people who are already stretched to the limit that you have to pay back this loan and so how do they get that society to pay back that loan they tell the government, these crony capitalists who borrowed the money from the IMF and who lined their pockets and who bought their Rolls Royces and their yachts and their jets. They tell them that you have to slash domestic funding for health care, for education and for welfare in order to pay back this debt. And so now we have people working around the clock and they're using up and utilizing their resources and they had nothing to do with negotiating this loan and they got no benefit from getting that loan and on top of all of that the services that they did have before they got the loan all of those were withdrawn and so now in return for giving up their labor for giving up their wealth they got nothing, in fact they got less than nothing they went back to the stone age no services, no electricity, no clean water no education, no medical care And this is not the end of it. For every dollar that they borrowed in order to pay for energy, for every dollar that they borrowed, those countries are still paying the debt to this very day. For every dollar that they borrowed, they have to pay back $25 in penalties and interest. If that's not slavery, you tell me what it is. If that's not bondage, you tell me what it is. If that's not prison, you tell me what it is. This is petrodollar recycling. And so there is a giant sucking sound of wealth and resources from the poor countries to the wealthy countries. And all with the agency of this Saudi monstrosity in Arabia. For they are the primary beneficiaries of this mega wealth and these windfall profits. And they were the ones who deposited the bulk of that cash that they made in U.S. banks and financial institutions which was turned around and loaned back to poor Muslim countries. And so they were the primary beneficiaries. And they were at the head and at the crux of the greatest financial crime perhaps in history the movement of trillions of dollars from the poor people to the wealthy people in the world. This was the beginning of globalization. Globalization began in the 1970s. But globalization again did not happen in a vacuum 
the emergence of Wahhabism as a major political force in the world, its concurrent emergence with globalization is not a coincidence. Globalization needs Wahhabism. Why? Why does globalization need the Wahhabi ideological or- orientation? Because Wahhabism privatizes Tawheed and socializes Taqfeed. What do you mean that it privatizes Tawheed? It makes the relationship of Tawheed the indivisibility, the indivisibility of Allah Ta'ala is the supreme authority. It makes that a relationship, a personal relationship between the individual and his God. Meaning that those who privatize their Tawheed, all they end up paying attention to is perfecting their ritual. Do I step into the masjid with my right foot? Do I step out with my left foot? Do I say Bismillah aloud? Or do I say it quietly before I recite the surahs in my salah? Do I break my fast right at sunset? Or do I break it 20 minutes after sunset? Is it considered to be riba when I have an installment agreement? Or is it considered to be a riba when I have a compound financial transaction in a bank? This is the privatization of Tawheed. And it is necessary for globalization. For it is the privatization of Tawheed which neutralizes the, the social character of Muslims, which would challenge the financial system that causes the polarization of wealth. But those who want the kind of freedom that ravages the resources of poor people, they don't want to have anything to do with the socialization of Allah's authority in their financial transactions. They don't want to have anything to do with Allah Ta'ala managing their financial transactions. And so that's why it was necessary for them to privatize this Tawheed, this authority of Allah as an individual relationship between themselves and their God. They didn't want a social relationship between their society and their God. Because that would get them to not be able to make these windfall profits. But it should just be the other way around. Tawheed ought to be socialized and taqseed ought to be privatized. I mean, we are talking about a socialized Tawheed. We are talking about a cooperative relationship between the members of society that help all of the members conform to the command and counsel of Allah. They help each other refer themselves to the law of Allah. They protect each other from Allah's corrective justice. They advise and counsel each other against the negative impact of Allah's corrective justice in their society. And thereby, automatically, the issue of taqseer becomes an individual matter. A person can decide for himself whether he is in conformity with Allah or whether he is resisting and denying Allah. Which is the way that it was at the time of Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Where are people talking about this bidah? Of privatizing tawheed and socializing taqseer. Isn't this a bidah? Especially when at the time of Allah's Messenger it was exactly the opposite. We didn't have a Gestapo running around analyzing whether Muslims were Catholics. Alhamdulillah.
الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله There are those in the world who are trying to dismantle this vicious cycle. They are doing their best to break the chains of financial bondage. <coughs> They're trying to destroy the shackles of death due to death. All of us are well aware of the sanctions and the embargo that has been imposed upon the Islamic public. They are weathering today a new round of imposed sanctions which have continued unabated for 33 years. And these sanctions are being now imposed upon the transactions conducted by the central bank of the Islamic government inside the Islamic Republic. The riba lords and the riba barons, they cannot countenance an organization, a government or a people that are going to manage their finances according to a just distribution mechanism. And so they are going to impose all manner of pressure, of sanctions, and ultimately war in order to destroy and to nip this Islamic pulse at its origin. But those who are with Allah, they see with the light of Allah. اتقوا فراسة المؤمن فإنه ينظر بنور الله Guard yourselves against the foresight and the insight of a mu'min for indeed his way is illuminated with the light of Allah. And so the Islamic Republic, because they are with Allah, they are being creative. And so they were told, if you can't, when their financial transactions were cut off, they enacted an agreement with the Indian government where they will sell oil for rupees. Not for dollars, but for rupees. They concluded this agreement just a week ago. And with regard to Pakistan, the Islamic Republic said that we will, we will give you oil in return for wheat. And so they will barter oil for wheat. And they will continue to march into the future. And so this is why we see the rhetoric in the media all over the world about the responsibility to protect. Look at the vultures in the world. They're saying that they have a responsibility to protect. They have a responsibility to protect the people in Syria. Now remind young African American males that get killed by neighborhood watch protectors right here at home. Now we have to go all the way out to Syria to protect the people over there. Never mind the women who are trafficked right here to the United States. 
for sex services. No, we have to go all the way to Libya to protect the people over there. Never mind the Native American population, which was decimated right here in the United States. No, we have to go all the way to Afghanistan to give rights to the women over there. Never mind the people who are suffering, standing in unemployment lines right here in the United States. No, we have to go all the way to the Middle East to give opportunities to the people who are coming in the Arab Spring. The responsibility to protect has a lot of holes in it. It has a lot of hypocrisy in it. It has a lot of duplicity in it. Our responsibility is to understand Allah's word and to enact a program to implement those words such that they become a social reality, such that they become an economic and a political reality. And if we find that doing that is too heavy a burden, then it is our responsibility to support those who have shouldered that burden. We can support them in words. We can support them with action. We can support them with our thoughts. We can support them with our thinking. And we can support them by standing proudly next to them and with them. But one option that we do not have is to stand here and do nothing. One option that we do not have is to not take a look at Allah's guidance and try to understand it and with that to try to understand the world that we are living in. So if we use Allah Ta'ala's guidance to understand the world that we are living in, what we have to, be, what we have to do will become crystal clear. Allahumma adina al-haqqa haqqan wa zukna al-tiba wa adina al-baqila baqilan wa zukna al-tinaba Allahumma aghfir al-mu'minin wa al-mu'minat الأحياء منهم والأموات إنك قريب سميع مجيب الدعوات اللهم ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار اللهم اهدنا في من هديت وعافنا في من عافيت وتولنا في من توليت وبارك لنا فيما عافيت وقنا واصرف عنا برحمتك شر ما قضيت إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان لفي قصر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر ومن أظلم ممن منع مساجد الله أن يذكر في حسنه وسعى في خرابها أولئك ما كان لهم أن يدخلوها إلا خائفين لهم في الدنيا خزي 
ولهم في الآخرة عذاب عظيم إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعظكم لعلكم تذكرون ولا ذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون وأقن الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر الحمد لله إله إلا الله 